It's so small. I know. It's great. You know, if you need a. You, want, you guys want one? Do you want one? Do you want one? Oh, you don't have any cool <laughs> oh, no, no. I didn't think you would. <laughs> 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 で、奥さんのやつ。はい、ジャニーさんです。あの、赤ちゃんは、ケース。で、赤ちゃんを抱いてる人が、キャッティ。で、赤ちゃんを抱いてる人が、キャッティ。で、赤ちゃんを抱い
And blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. Okay, one more time, from the top. <laughs> Oh, well, Mike, we don't have a chorus for that song. We'll play uh, down in the corner for me. When we're in Japan, we'll be watching this every Thursday night. Get out of there. You've got to edit out all our weird looks and funny faces and yawns. Okay. Okay, no. No. No, no. No, no. That's the one that we have a turn to. Okay. Ready?
life becomes strong. I say I'll talk to you, I'll read your word, I'll sing this worship song.
supposed to pause on that uh, yield. Down, on that yield. Retarded. Retarded? What are you saying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it slows down on yield. Maybe it's retarded. Whatever that. Musical word is. That's my retarded. Retarded. Yeah, I thought she was going to be retarded. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's good. That's good. <laughs> yeah, she said, I like that, that Spanish flavor there, that the retardo. Like, <laughs> retardo oh, muscle bomb. We saved our cats. 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 We saved our from Mata. Oh no, no. So, no. It's a hole. It? It it a hole? Yeah. yeah. Until until the director cuts oh, you off. Right. Yeah, from Mata. That's what it is. <laughs> you from Mata. Yeah. <laughs> hey, this is just group group <laughs> 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 Okay, go ahead. Are we doing this one over? Yeah, it's lower. You can stay with those seats. I'm going to dear Santa Bull, when you blow the water so much, so long about to be. You alone are my heart's desire. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Next. And there were several different roses that we all... looking at you, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> looking at you, Ken. I don't know if I can see it. Well, you were just in Japan, see. We're in Japan, we'll miss you guys too much. Uh-huh. They'll never let her come back. They'll never let her come back. They'll never let her come back. I saw in the side of the Lord. I saw in the side of the Lord. Yeah. Hey, is that, that's in that, uh, that's in that loop, uh, that's in that loop. 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 Uh, that's in that
Thank you. 
talk during Psalm 5 and see how you feel. Sure. Yeah, this one. Look at you. Here, Psalm 5. No, He is Lord. I want to say He is Lord. Excuse me. Are you going to start with this? You can come back here. Stop over. It's chatty cat. You are good to have you here. This is Psalm 5. Chatty. 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 No, no, Daniel, you should have requested that. Earlier. <laughs> oh. Okay, you want to use Lord? Yeah. And then Psalm 5. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Use Lord and then Psalm 5. All right. I'm going to set this to it. I'm sure you don't want I love you. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. We can see out that one. Okay, I love you, Lord, and then. Psalm 5. Psalm 5. Psalm 5. Psalm 5. Psalm 5. I'm not I love you, Lord. Oh, yeah, I love you. I love you, Lord. 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 Oh, actually, today's the day of prayer. Is it really? Yeah, it's the day of prayer. Wow, yeah. cool. But this guy, this is written by a doctor that's in a cardiac care unit up in the Bay Area. And he was noticing that people that are prayed for need less medical attention. Wow. wow. They really do better. He's not a Christian. Zoom right in there. <laughs> okay. But I'll, I won't read the whole thing, but, but uh, part of it, he gets down to like a, kind of like a physics level about prayer. And he doesn't mention Jesus, which is kind of bad, but still, overall. This one part I thought was interesting. He said, uh, let's see, what is the scientific basis for the notion that praying before an illness is actually observed and might prevent it? Now, prevent it from happening. 
says, a lot of people think the laws of physical science end with what we learned in grade school, that time flows in a straight line, never backwards or in circles, and that cause precedes effect rather than the other way around. But the rel relatively new quantum physics now studied by the majority of physicists dramatically differ from this view. In fact, the theory holds that at the subatomic level, events may not actually occur until they are observed. Like Debbie was saying, you know, a tree in the forest, you know, if it falls, do you hear it? Yeah. I mean, is there a sound? No one's there. It doesn't make sense. So, in fact, okay, it's so the theory holds it. Okay, before then, before that, that happens, there are only a number of possibilities. Nothing has been set. Some scientists believe that if reality is in fact tied to the actions of the observer, then it may be possible to shape reality through what we call a mental effort or prayer. Now apply this to the medical realm. It may be that before an illness is detected, you can prevent it through through mental effort or through prayer. And he goes through some other stuff too about you know physics and things and how God there's no time with God. This is kind of you know because we're under that that thing. But with him it's nothing. You know. It's, it's all his. So it was just kind of weird. I was thinking, you know, it's kind of that predestiny thing. It was an interesting article. Well, along that line of, you know, sort of along that line, mm -hmm. I was just wondering, especially now that you say Jennifer wants to talk to us. Um, last week, we got a message on the recorder from Rusty Conway. At Foster Freeze, and all it said was, uh, "I guys, this is Rusty from Foster's. Or, are you guys okay? Is everything all right? You know, I just just wanted to check on you, see if everything's okay." Like, he, I thought it was because we hadn't been in there for a week, you know. So I'm like, this is his best customer. And so I went in uh, a couple days ago, mostly because I wanted to see what he called about why. You know, because it sounded urgent somehow. And so I said, I said, hey, what's going on? He goes, did you get my message? I said, yeah. He goes, you guys doing okay? I said, yeah. And he said, he said, well, for three nights in a row, I think it was either two or three, he woke up in the morning and knew he'd been dreaming about me and Sean. And then on Sunday, or I guess it was only Sunday, he, um, he, he was confirmed in the Lutheran church, he and his wife, by a bishop from somewhere. And he said, that day the sermon was on uh, listening to the still small voice and responding. And then the next morning, he woke up knowing he had dreamt about us. He didn't know what it was specifically, but for a week almost, for several days, he had dreamt about us. And he said, I just had kept having this feeling that something, something, critical was going on with you guys, you know. And I'm like, I don't well it got me thinking like, is there some maybe we would have died or something if he hadn't thought and prayed for us, you know, or something. But then I but then I wondered if it coincided when with Jen, when Jennifer went to get an abortion. You know, and then you think about the time thing, you know. Well what does it have to do with us? But maybe it had a lot to do with us. And, the, yeah. and our yeah. family. Did Jennifer get an abortion? No. She went she went. She had money. Her mom just begged her not to and took her money and they oh, fought. really? Oh, and she got her money, money back and, oh. and she went down there and she found out that she was farther along than she thought she was. And she, in her mind, she had this cutoff point and she was passing it up. Oh, crazy. She still has Did they try to talk her into it after that? Or? Actually, they set her up with a counselor because she was real confused at that point. They did not try to talk her into it. I asked her that myself because, you know, you wonder how money grubby they are. Yeah. But I was pretty proud of her. And if God's intervening on it, it wouldn't make any difference, would it? Yeah. Right. It just blows me away when I think about that because we're like, you know, birth to death and what everything goes in a straight line. And you see that in PT all the time, you know, people are, they're, so they're dying, and that's just the way it is. But with God, it's just, mm -hmm. you know, you know something's happening, yeah. Because the Lord and Christ wanted me to pray for Jennifer, too. Mm. So did Jennifer call you back? No, but she, I called her today, yeah, today, and uh, she said, Does, do Melissa and Sean still, are they still thinking about this thing, you know, she don't want to say it, and I said, oh, definitely, their mind hasn't changed. And she said, well, I 
just want to know what they mean, you know, and what, what it means. And I said, I can't answer those questions, so you're going to have to call Melissa. I want you two to talk. She's just going crazy with one baby. Yeah. And no future. Yeah. Well, she's got one baby, and now she's pregnant. And you guys were talking about that. We offered her. Is she, where is she at now? She's, She's back home with her mom in a cramped little apartment. You know, uh, they, uh, I finally got to go back to the Bible study at church so on Thursday mornings at 6. And uh, well, kind of on the subject that we talked mm -hmm. about, uh, he hands out a little questionnaire. I think it's in that Bible. So tell me. And uh, he hands out a little questionnaire. I think it's in that Bible. So tell me. And uh, he hands out a little questionnaire. I think it's in that Bible. So tell me. And uh, he hands out a little questionnaire. I think it's in that Bible. So tell me. And uh, he hands out a little questionnaire. And he makes up one of these every time. He says, when you experience hardship, what helps you be patient and wait for God? And when, when we took that, you know, everybody talked about it. The pastor said what helps him is he's a pilot. But he said, uh, when, you know, it's that, it's taking on God's perspective. And, and like he, for him, it's getting in the Word. And when he does it, he gets God's perspective. And that pulls him out of the situation enough to where he can look at it like at the big picture. And I was thinking about it when that, because there was a time there when I was going through a lot of strife and the guard was really pressuring me to spend more time out there and the airlines pressuring me to spend more time there and I was flying to work one day and I'm in the little Cessna going over the top of Fresno. And if you look at, if you look at California, Fresno's, you know, it fills up the whole as far as you can see. And then you look at Fresno, it's, it's a big city but it's just a little bit. California. And then when I look at the airport, that's just a little bit of Fresno. And then when I look at the guard base, that's just a little bit of the airport. And I looked there and I said, that little tiny speck is is making my whole reality. You know, it's forcing and driving my whole reality. And you look at it, you go, it's nothing. It's, 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 a, it's just nothing in the whole you know, world of things. <laughs> He's not a postal worker. But, I, but it's that way, and I mean... He's I'm, not a postal worker. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking at the guard like base. dropping bombs out there. <laughs> I'm looking at this base, which is big, you know, I mean, what employs a couple thousand people. So then you look at... Then I started backing that up going, God, you know, I started looking, looking at houses and how small they are, and how small I am in a house, and how insi totally insignificant my problems that I, you know, this problem is, I shouldn't be so focused on it, I should be focused on God and give up this thing, because uh, his pers when you take on his perspective, you realize how really little uh, some of the hardships you're going through are, you know, and how. By the time we realize that, that we have heart disease and blood pressure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Start now, you know. Pray now and maybe back up. And amongst that is, and this applies, that made me think of the Bible study group, is um, in the uh, James. Hmm. It says, is anyone well, I'll start with the what? So we can follow along. James uh James. James. Is that five? James five thirteen. Isn't that what we study? It is. Mm -hmm. It is. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Yes. But that doesn't, like I, I struggle with this on a patient that I have, because he's wondering about that, like he's a quad, and he said, well, you know, I have this faith, and I pray every night, I'll just sit here crying, praying, crying, praying, crying, and praying, praying, but nothing happens. So, but it's got to be in the will of God. No, he just do doesn't that. have a faith. 
No, you know what? No, you got, when I when I read this, it wasn't it wasn't the the faith healing there that that struck me, but it was verse sixteen, where it says, "Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another, so that you may be healed." And and before that also, in fifteen, where it says, "And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins." They will be forgiven him, and so like it's like they're praying for someone, like you're praying for someone to be healed, and if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him through the power of prayer in the in the elders praying for someone. You know that what what strikes me about you know what you said, the elders, mm -hmm. of course, pops right in my mind too, because it obviously it doesn't work. Right. You know? Yeah. There's some wrench in there somewhere. But, you know, if you think about it, um, you know, it says, you know, you, if you pray for one who's sick, the Lord will raise him up and he'll be forgiven. That is the important thing. Right. And, and, and I remember when I was first a Christian going to a charismatic Methodist, you know, it was a church thing, mm -hmm. but it was charismatic and it was on mm -hmm. healing and the gifts of the Spirit. And they said, and they got together in this, like a big boardroom in a hotel, and they said, okay, what do we do about healing? Why aren't we healed? You know, it's like, it was like, how are we going to, yeah, how do we accept it or whatever? And pretty much people were feeling like, you know, okay, take take someone like Joni Erickson or something. Where are we? Joni. She's never been healed, but she is inside. Right. And so everyone kind of felt like the healing, the important healing, will happen. That's why I was telling Randy the squad, you know, I said that, that pretty much it, God's doing this for some reason. For you to get to some point, and really whether the physical healing takes place or not is almost irrelevant. It's yeah. your relationship with Him. That's Easy to what say, counts. yeah. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> Well, it's like God heals from the inside out, mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, a good place to start is um, confessing our faults to one another. Yeah. yeah, that's, you know, I think the point is not whether faith healing works or not. I think the point is more that that we should pray for each other and, and uh, it cares more than, than, uh, you, you know, it, there's more to it, like in your article, there's more to it than just, than just the physical amount of words, you know, there's something spiritual that takes place and there's a forgiveness of sins and there's healing and stuff. Well, and God, God looks at the whole, the whole person, I mean, he doesn't separate the physical part from the spiritual, emotional, and so but what God knows is that some people in some circumstances for whatever reason, if they get the physical healing, they won't go on to get the rest, you know, and only He knows why and we can never judge a person that way. But, you know, I think too that one of the keys here is understanding what it means when it says the prayer offered in faith. More and more, I'm I'm becoming convinced that what God's talking about in instances like these is a specific faith that He gives as a gift to believe for what He wants to do in that particular circumstance. And so that the first thing we pray for is, God, what do you want to do? And this is inferred in instances like when Jesus and, and the apostles, when they raised people from the dead, first they got everybody out of the way, they got all the distractions out of the way, and they went and they prayed. And after they prayed, then they said, get up. And see, the reason they said get up is because I believe that when they prayed, God showed them or told them that that's what He wanted to do in that instance. And then knowing what God wanted, they could pray accordingly with complete assurance of faith. Which we can't we can't do by just assuming well God always wants to heal. But then the 
the tricky part of that is then knowing yeah. what God wants. Because I've done that. Yeah. The big upset in my life was praying for this baby that I knew God wanted to heal. Absolutely, positively, that was the one thing I knew. And I believed the same way. That God doesn't heal everybody, but when you know what's right, and that's what God's going to do, then you can pray in faith and be perfectly confident. Baby died, you know, so. But, baby died and the Lord raised him up. I guess. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's hard. I just believe we should give up on praying that way. No, I, th I think you should just, like you, you said, pray for whatever you want, you know, with Dylan. Pray for exactly how you want him to be, you know, to, you know. And accept what God gives. Yeah. I don't think there, is there an instance in here that you can think of where, where somebody asked Jesus to heal them and he never did? There, I don't think there is in this instance. The rich young ruler. You know, and that's and that's that's a, that's another one of the real keys to it. I mean, you can't study formulas to this, but mm -hmm. somehow the person being healed has to has to somehow experience contact with Jesus personally himself. Mm -hmm. I mean, you. I mean, and even that's not always. I mean, there 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 are people who, um, you know, other had no faith at all, and somebody else prayed for them, and they got healed. For whatever reason. What's interesting, like today, I've got, I had a, I had a woman that's, uh, she has Guillain Barre. First she had valley fever, and now she has Guillain Barre, and she's 38, and she can't move, nothing, wow. fingers, toes, nothing. She can only blink her eyes. That's it. But because her family, you know, the Christians, and, uh, and, and, and I happened to be on this case, then I was telling Kelly, who's the people out in Hanford. And their church will be praying for them. And then I'll tell you guys, her name's Cora Moon, so that you guys will be praying for her. And maybe that's how God spreads things around. Yeah. You know, get people to pray. So that's kind of cool. She's, at, she's out in some house out in Stratford, and she's got all these people praying for her. And she doesn't even know that. Well, when you, when you think about it, you know, I think, when, like you said, when people contact Jesus and ask, he did, without exception, and, and yet, right now, we don't see, and we can't see and touch Jesus now, so I think what, I think what God wants us to do is to, is to pray and seek Him until, until He becomes more and more real to us. And, and, and then you get to a place where you under, see they could see and feel how Jesus loved them right there. I mean, you know, the way he looked at them, whatever whatever it was, they just knew that he was giving, freely giving them what they needed. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's the biggest stumbling block for people is not feeling worthy, mm -hmm. not feeling like loved enough to, mm -hmm. to be able to ask him and receive that. And that's one of my prayer requests tonight too, is that uh, I'm gonna, I, I thought about uh, when I work with people, praying with them before we do it, you know, before I actually do the exercises and stuff like that, which is really, it's a no-no. Because somebody's going to step on somebody's toes and they're going to say, you know, you either stop or you won't have a job. Working on as long as you ask the patient. That's what I do. Pray yeah. Yeah. Just ask their permission. Well, yeah, but I want to do it with everybody. I mean, even the you know, hardcore mm -hmm. yeah, blah, 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 people. That's that why you go like this. Carry your article around. You go, you yeah. go, you go, Ernie. You lay hands like this. Okay, ten times up. <laughs> but it's only one sided. They should be in on it. You know what? Though? I, I, I don't, I don't think God wants us to do that stuff all the time in every instance. I mean, I think He really wants us to learn. To be sensitive to his spirit as he's moving in the moment. <coughs> you know, I mean, you you wouldn't just go witness to every person you meet on the street. Yeah, I, I, I guess that's true. I don't feel guilty about that anymore. I used to feel guilty about that, but I don't anymore. It's like you're saying being sensitive. The, I guess. The, I don't the, know. The Maybe key, I'm the wrong. Question, Maybe we should be doing that. The, the key question in every situation or circumstance is, 
Well, God, what do you want me to do now? Speaking of which, we should ask God what he wants us to do right now. Yeah, well, well, Wayne, do you have anything for us? We're today? doing great. I wonder though, we we read in the scriptures about the healings that occur and, and how they occurred. But would it have been remarkable for them to have written of the guys that the elders had prayed for, but they died? And that they were at peace that this is what the Lord... I mean, surely among the elders, someone died somewhere along the line that they prayed for. You just don't read about it because it wasn't remarkable. It didn't make good print. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't anything to prove a point. Yeah. Well, it's like Jesus and the, and the sick and the lepers and stuff and the beggars. After he was very popular, you would imagine that there would be lots of them, and the stories of him healing people had spread. There would be whole groups of them begging for healing, but you only hear about one here and there. You know, no, there. I mean, there's this where it says the crowds gathered, all the sick came in the streets. I mean, two or three times it's recorded mm -hmm. that did happen. Where he did heal, and it says he healed them all. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, in, now in Capernaum it does say that he didn't do many miracles because it was his own hometown and there was lack of faith there. But, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I, I think I have to disagree a little bit with Dwayne because I don't think the scriptures are written like our newspapers today where they print what's spectacular. And, yeah, but you know. have you seen, so do you think that everyone that the early church ever prayed for was healed? Um, not, not necessarily. Uh, that's what you're saying. Yeah, they, they just they would they tell the story tell to us the one that. But I, you know, I don't know. I, I don't. And it's it's hard to say. I, I think if it was if they felt it was important for people's faith and understanding, they would have they would have written that. They would have written more about you know. But but he you know they did say things like. Um, in all things, give thanks. You know, I mean, and I mean, Paul talked about himself being all the trouble he went through. You know, not necessarily he didn't talk much about sickness and disease per se, as we, you know, but he talked about the thorn in the side. You know, that's right. The that, thing that never got healed in him. That's right. Whatever it was, physical or spiritual or emotional. You know. You know he, Here's a suggestion, I don't know if you want to do it now, but a few weeks ago I was reading this passage in James and I looked up the scriptures about Elijah that the mm -hmm. references about how how did Elijah actually pray? And it's that was a suggestion the pastor made this morning too, was to hmm. look at the great men of the Old Testament. And Elijah specifically for how how a man of God for them. That was one of the questions. What was the answer? What do you think the prayer of a righteous man sounds like? Wow. I, I think it sounds uh, where you can't hear it. If you're according to like, at least the one scripture where Jesus said, if you're going to pray, you know, don't do it and uh, stand up in front of the whole group and everything. Just go into the, the bathroom or whatever. And, but I don't think Elijah did that. He didn't have a bathroom up there in the woods. <laughs> in the wilderness, though. <laughs> in the wilderness, yeah. Okay, when I read uh, the first King 17, uh, mm -hmm. 1, and then uh, 18, 41 to 45, we don't see anything here that we normally think of as praying. It's not, if, it, if he did it, it's not recorded. All it's recorded is that he gave commands. He said, um, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will, there will, he just made statements, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except in my word. So he had, he, maybe he had prayed to the place where he could say that with such assurance of faith. There's no doubt about it, folks, this is going to happen. And then at the, in, in 1841, he, he gives command to Ahab, now he's 
telling people what to do. And this does not fly in our culture today, <laughs> except among radical Pentecostals or charismatic stuff. But he says, go, eat, drink, for there's a sound of heavy rain. <coughs> and he told his servant, go look toward the sea. And he could have he could have really doubted too. Because the servant came back seven times and said, There's nothing there. He said, Go back. Go back. Because he knew it would, he knew what was gonna happen. And, and I think that I I think what they're saying here is that is possible for every one of us. If we if we don't give up on our journey toward toward hearing and seeing what God wants to do. It's also do you think that uh, God talked to Elijah differently than he talks to us today? Because it, it, many times it refers to, then the Lord said to Elijah. Like it was almost audible. I don't think it's necessarily audible, but I personally do not believe. I'm not a dispensationalist. I don't What's believe that? that things were different before Christ came and they're different now after the only difference is it's easier to believe in his death and resurrection because of its, its history. You know? But I, I don't, it says here, Elijah was a man just like us. This book was written about 20 years after Christ died, or yeah, 20 years after Christ died. And he said, Elijah's a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it wouldn't rain. It didn't. And again, he prayed, and so what? But that, that, that focuses more, to me, it focuses more on like Elijah prayed earnestly that it wouldn't rain and then it didn't. But what if his brother Moab prayed exactly the opposite, just as earnestly? <laughs> well, see, that's why I, I, don't, I don't think our understanding, our modern English understanding of what it means to pray earnestly, okay. I don't think is accurate. So you don't think it's a group where we all get together and... Well, it's not, it's not a mean. group with an agenda. I think no. I, I think I think he's praying. I think what what's happening here is it's not like he he says it's not like he decides. Hey, I want to punish Ahab this way, so I'm going to pray and say it won't rain. It's not Elijah deciding what he's going to ask for. First, I think what's inferred here is he's asking God, "What do you want to do?" And when he knows what God wants to do, then he then he asks for it. He puts it into words, and he, you know. And so, what I think groups like this need to do, I think we need to in our own prayer closets at home, like you said, in private, but also when we come together here. Is when we when a problem comes up, maybe we need some some silent moments where we're asking God, God, show us what you want to do. And then not be afraid to say to each other, hey, I think God wants us to pray this way. What do you think? And when we, and it says we're two or three agree, <coughs> agree on what we think God's telling us to pray for, then we pray for it. But even that's a little bit, because it seems to me, I bet you he didn't go and say, okay, God, what punishment? What is it? I bet you, you know, he prayed the way he said, you know, he said, oh, no rain, okay. You know, it was almost an action. You know, like when, you know, like when you see the bum on the street and you just know what you're supposed to in do. A that. Yeah, in a split second, not because you've been struggling over right. it. And right. it, 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 would, it could happen both ways. But, but if we say also, okay, well, you're getting here to pray. God will tell us. You know, we, it may not come that way. Well, that's you know? right. Uh, like in my I, own experience. I, yeah, I agree with that. I mean, but, um, it, but it's just having the heart and mind of God. Well, that was Elijah. I mean, as a lifestyle. Elijah right there. He was just like yeah. a channel. It was a yeah. promise that God had given in the earlier times where yeah. if they didn't obey him, this is what would happen. The land would dry up, and if they did obey him, it was. I mean, well, yeah, he gave that. Standards. He gave that word when they were just, walking in the like, wilderness. Hey, God, he's just yeah. speaking forth what was prophesied by God. Just consequences um, for sin. But the specifics, the specifics about three and a half years or whatever, that wasn't important. You know, what if, that's, that's the kind of thing where God can... See, I, I, I agree with you. Sometimes these things just light oh. upon your mind and you just... You just have a sense of just know this is the Lord. But it, you don't think it's always like that. But I, no, I think, well, I think, I think we can, help, we, sometimes we can cooperate with that process by getting still before the Lord. Like it says, be still and know that I'm God. 
get still, get maybe get a journal and a pen out and say, okay, God, whatever you want to say to me, whatever you want to show me, like in Habakkuk, um, he said, I'll stand at my guard post and watch, and I'll see what he has to say to me. And then the Lord said, record the vision. And that, com those, that combination of seeing, hearing, and writing is repeated several times throughout Scripture. You see the same thing in Revelation. That was the normal mode of operation for the prophets. Mm -hmm. But in, the, it, in prayer, is, at least as far as I understand it, the New Testament is now, we have the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is actually the one doing the praying. All we are is just kind of hanging out. And God's really praying to Himself, almost through us. Well, I think that in all situations, you can't put God to a formula or to a box. Mm -hmm. And to say that, you know, you don't, you're only going to get divine inspiration if you quietly read, pray, and write. Mm -hmm. Or if you uh, are in tune to what goes on at the moment and you act upon what you know in your heart God wants you to do. Both of those are right. And uh, he, I don't think you can limit God to uh, saying He only talks then and He doesn't talk now, or He only healed then and men were only men of God then and they don't, they're not men of God now. That, I don't think any of that's true. I think God's the same yesterday and today and forever. And he, uh, it's, it's just a matter of, of being obedient and being willing to do to be obedient, you know. And from then on, like you said, it's a daily, a situational surrendering of will to His will. Mm -hmm. It's like, um, I always like that the, the thing of Moses, you know, coming on the Red Sea. Imagine all these, all these plagues, miracles taking place to get them out of Egypt. Now they come to the Red Sea, and there's the sea, and here come the Egyptians after them. And the thoughts that are going through his mind, you know. Now, Moses did not part the Red Sea, you know, because he's no more powerful than any of us. True. But, and I know a lot of people back in the, in the, in the, in the you know, name it, claim it kind of phase, that were using, would use Moses, and you know, all he did was raise his staff and, and told the sea to part, and there it goes. You know, well, I firmly believe that God told him to raise his staff and say, part and the sea would part, and he was being obedient, and when he was obedient, the miracle happened. Mm -hmm. Because God didn't want Moses to part the sea, he wouldn't even want that kind of competition. You know? it, Moses was simply being obedient. Here, here's, here's a, but, it did take his hand raised up. That's right. There God, was some there action was, that he needed there was, to do. There was some surrender. I mean, it wasn't, you know, just really no, sure Wouldn't that no. be scary? Well, Deb, you can imagine, here's, what, three and a half million Israelites behind him, <laughs> watching, and he's like, what are you going to do now? He's what's, the, what's the Moses guy going to do now? I knew we should have stayed in Egypt. Yes. We had everything good there. You're so lucky. Like, you know, you know how Jews are. Oh, yeah. And so here you are, you got three and a half million like of them Gentiles. whining at the, at the sea, going, what are we going to do? They're going to come and slaughter us. And he's saying, and God's saying, just raise up, raise up your staff and it'll unseal part. Just raise it up and seal part. Yeah, right. Raise the staff, <laughs> and the sea's going to part. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, right. Where's the bridge, God? You know what I mean? So, Testing it up. <laughs> God always requires something yes. like that. There's always a little... It's like, you know, you're talking about baptism. What's the significance of it? And I think the significance of it isn't getting washed with a little bit of water. It's that step you take to publicly... Yeah, exactly. you have to publicly what? do something what you stupid and humiliating. Yeah. Anything that <laughs> stupid and humiliating. Anything that oh, yeah, stupid but humiliating. Anything that dumb, like singing that song, you know. Uh, okay, using the same logic, guys. Get mm -hmm. this. If, so, so if God, like James three, says he wants to get our tongue under control, right? So what if he wants us to do something stupid, like speak in tongues out loud? Mm -hmm. It's a sad, I, I believe that's, that's the same kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, BTDT. BTDT BT, got the t-shirt. <laughs> got the t-shirt. <laughs> what was then they're then done, they're that. done that. <laughs> we did it. No, it's, it's, it's weird, it's but I, 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 I totally agree with you. I think, I think there's a place where God says, look, are you going to set aside your reputation, your pride, everything, and just do it? Mm -hmm. and, and I think you're right. Tongues probably fall right in that same category. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. I think uh, <coughs> there's lots of things that do this. God's logic is, God's will or whatever you want to call it, is so far beyond ours that it, it, it's like matter and antimatter in Star Trek. You know, the two, <laughs> the two explode when they hit because there we think compatible. everything exactly backwards. You have to be successful and independent to be uh, a good a good person. Mm. And God says, no, you have to be dependent and humble. You have to be the lowest. You know, mm. when you enter a room, you should sit at the at the chair of the lowest person at the table. Mm. Uh, you know, when you're when you're weak, I'm strong. When uh, I mean, it just keeps going and going. Everything, everything he says is uh, exactly the opposite. You know, yeah, you give up, you give up your life, you'll save it. Uh, I mean, that's why you see, you know, you see people invariably when you go into home health. You know, you go out and you see people that are, they have a nice home, they have all the secure things, they're dying in bed in their bedroom, and unless they're Christian, they're miserable. They got nothing. They got nothing, and they know they're facing nothing. Yeah. Um, you're talking about Moses and what, you know, he either heard or or saw, like, he, he may have seen an image of, you know, what he was supposed to do. Or he may have heard a voice. Yeah. Or he may have just had the thought. Yeah. Right. Whatever God put in him. You know. I have a let's, question. Let's, I'm oh, I'm sorry, you weren't done. Well, that's okay. Uh, you go ahead, but uh, I, I, Oops, have, not really. I have uh, about three, four verses from John about Jesus, mm -hmm. like the same kind of thing. Go right ahead. Okay, do you guys want to look at John 5.19? <clears throat> Even Jesus said, I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing by Himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing. Because what the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son, and he shows him all he does. And this is really current, present tense in the now, because like you see in verse 17, it says, My father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. Okay, so that's, he does what he sees his father doing. And then if you look down verse 30, it's a similar statement. It says, by myself, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear. And my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but to the second. And then if you turn over to John 8, 828, he says, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am the one I claim to be. And that I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. So you get the sense, and, and the Greek behind the word says, do what the Father has taught me. It's not so much the way we think of teaching and learning, and then later on you use it down the road. It's more like, Immediate. It's immediate. It, and it's like the idea here is that just keeps coming up. Yeah. The father was always with him, showing him what to do, telling him what to do, not as a taskmaster and a slave driver, but like Jesus told us, he says, I don't call you servants anymore, I call you friends because I told you everything I plan to do. I should, here's all my plans, guys. Well, that, that's true during your daily activities. I mean, that's it's for everyone, you know. It's like you're working with someone and, you, and God says, you know, tell them this. And then there's always, you gets in the way. Wait. <laughs> yeah. Kidding? You want me to tell them what? <laughs> and, then, and, then in John, and then the moment passes. In John 14, he says the same thing. Um, then, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? And the words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his own works and works. And then, truly I say to you, if you believe in me, you will do these works. So it's just like he's passing on that, you know, handing the torch to us to do what he was doing. It's tricky. like being a channel. You know. mm -hmm. yeah. The tricky part of us is body doing together.
Okay, well, we'll oh, it's just, I, I missed, when I went through the Bible the first time, I missed, how come Moses didn't get to go in the promised land? Because what did he do wrong? when God told him to strike the rock once for water, to get water, he struck it and nothing came out right away, so he struck it again. That's what Jeez. <laughs> wow. oh, another, 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 another amazing idiot Yeah, but you know what? You know what? Adults. There's. You're right. It is. <laughs> but it's it's significant in that Moses is hitting the rock. You know, in other words, Moses is making himself kind of like Jesus or something. You know. So it was he was Moses really looking into thinking, his heart. Yeah, Moses is thinking he <clears throat> is bringing the water out of the rock. That's why he's hitting it a second time. Well, and he was ticked off, too. Yeah. And, and, and because he was in such a position of leadership, and everyone is, he's modeling for the whole nation. And, and, and another version, I don't know if it's in Deuteronomy or what, there's two, there's two versions of that story. But another version is that God told him, like, I believe, I remember correctly, God told him to speak to the rock. Instead of speaking to it, he hit it. Oh. And, and God, I don't know if God was trying to show the people something about the spoken word or whatever, but I mean, that's another version. It's similar, just basically the same reason. He, he wasn't specifically obedient, but it, it was in his heart. Mm -hmm. He was being patient, angry, you know. He didn't have God's perspective. Yeah, he was, he was just kind of... It seemed like such a small thing. He just had a bad attitude one day. Well, Elijah, Elisha, on his deathbed, I just read this today, told one of the kings of Judah or Israel, I can't remember which one, he, he said, come over here and uh, pull your bow back and let me shoot the arrow. So he shot the arrow, and it flew out the window and it landed, and he said, you are going to uh, defeat Syria right there on that spot. And they said, take the rest of the arrows and strike them on the ground as hard as you can. Well, the king, I guess, half-heartedly went like this three times, and Elisha was mad. And he said, okay, for that, because you you should have struck and struck those arrows five or six times. For that, you will not completely defeat the, the kingdom of Syria, but you'll defeat them with three victories, but they, they won't be wiped out. For that little thing. So Look at the Ananias and Sapphira who right. sold their land yeah. and gave mm -hmm. most of the money to the church. But they lied. Mm -hmm. But they lied. And how, how, can, how can we live I know. and do all the heinous yeah. things we do day after day? Do you remember in Narnia, and I can't remember her name, she was a little tomboy, and at the beginning of the book, Aslan takes them to, you know, they get through the into the next world and they're on a cliff oh, I remember and they have to jump off and he's supposed to jump off first and then her but he's like scared or something and she just she gets impatient and she jumps because she's a, she's a show off it screws up the entire plan because they had specific steps to follow they're supposed to be obedient to these seven steps or whatever. and it goes from like two books or something at the end of the whole thing when everything finally works out but it was totally screwed up because she jumped the gun to show up. And Aslan says, and she's but God, why? Oh, just man, why did we have to? And he goes, do you remember when you were on the precipice or something, you know? Yeah. And you jumped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was supposed to jump. Who was supposed to? It was like, fun, big thing. But because she, and he said, why did you jump? Well, were you showing up? Well, yeah, but that little tiny uh, attitude thing messes Does it make you wonder, oh, all of our little grievances to God, how much they must screw up our life when we don't even know it. It probably affects generations, you know. <laughs> yeah. It's kind I of think scary. I, I, it is. Well, as I look at my life, I, I definitely see where, you know, God is, God in His grace, I mean, when we screw up the plan, He... He, he adjusts the plan so eventually things work out. But a lot of the things that were, where there's serious delays and a lot of things happening, mm -hmm. yeah. I think you know, I think there are consequences. There are consequences to our our, our attitudes, especially. And, uh, look, look, look at Abraham. You know, he was old to begin with, but. Uh, 
the business of having going into a servant role, he figured, well, God wants to have a baby, we'll do it one way or the other. Forget about waiting for Sarah. You know? Well, Sarah asked him to go. <laughs> yeah, well, right, she she did. But they, they were both they were both wrong. Yeah. You know, and there was a, a long delay. Mm -hmm. And well, what what happened? What the consequence of that? We get the Arabs. Right, the Arab-Israeli conflict. Right. Talking about generations. Right. right. Oh. I mean, well, well, look at the whole. I mean, so you've been mapping. <laughs> <laughs> and the man who went along with it. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, it's like Lewis says, I think he's so accurate. He said that probably the greatest sin is the sin of pride. Because it is so subtle. And, and it thinks it thinks itself no wrong. And, and it's... And it's like the foundation or whatever of all other sins, but but it is the worst because it's the foundation of man. It's what we exist on. We, I think we learn that as we grow up. Yeah. We have to have pride. We feed. Well, it's on more that even that you look at Eve's sin and everything. That's a sin of pride. Yeah. And the one with uh, Moses striking the rock. You know, and and uh, he says, Lewis suggests even that it's much easier for a prostitute to get into heaven than it is a prideful man, yeah. a prideful no, Christian. Yes, Lewis. Yeah. Yeah. She has no pride. Well, he's saying that, see, uh, a sin of lust, a sin of the flesh, like prostitution, is that is, is something that, uh, you know, if you ask any prostitute, she doesn't, she doesn't usually want to do it. But the sin of pride, there will be a men, men in church who are probably even visited the prostitute, who are going around saying, gosh, she is such a low person, low life, I am such a righteous man, you know, or... Uh, you know, I'm not going to talk to this person because I'm way above them in class and income or whatever else. And, and you know, this, and you need to be doing that. You need to get your life together, brother. You know, I mean, they're walking around like that. And, you know, right. they could never put themselves on that level. Yeah. Where I'm just like you. Whereas for her, for the prostitute, it would be very easy to look up to God, you know, and to be humble. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that's the big killer. That's what Jesus said, we ought to come in like children. When we, re when we finally realize that hey, we're all just children of God, I mean, that's it. That's all we are. It, it, it kind of levels. So. so, Dwayne, did you have anything to add? <laughs> <laughs> Instead of asking us questions, just just yeah. tell us, just tell us, give us the. Yeah. Or you could say this. Or if he does that, then you can use it next time. Live for your I do. I'm regretting talking so much. Yeah. Shame, shame on you. Well, Dwayne, maybe you should ask. Did you have anything to say? <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> do have a prayer request. Uh, Janice's uh, grandmother. Probably by now has walked her way. No circulation. She just all of a sudden. Her. She died. Well, she, no. She, she doesn't move. She's she rather just, she's, in bed and, uh, she can't see her, and so she just assumes stay in bed mm -hmm. and deal with things. You know, oh, I can't think of. Yeah, she has such bad hair. Well, I didn't know, but in the last two months she's been in a rest home. I didn't know that. She won't get out of bed, and she's lost circulation in her feet. And she probably may have been a blood clot. Yeah. Well, she couldn't get out of bed. No. They put you in there, and that's it. And she was living at home. They had to go and get her up. She said that. No. Yes. <laughs> she said that. As in Lisa oh. Dawn's brook. <laughs> Lisa and Dawn's brook. Bye. Bye. Are you fading off? Bye bye. Oh, oh, bye. Bye. Yeah. Yeah. See ya. <laughs> Yeah, well, the it's the end of the tape. And okay.